Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alientude, and today I am reviewing this Albion Next Generation Baron. Now, before diving into this review, I want to talk a little bit about my channel and a trend that you might have noticed that is not indicative of a long-term change. There's uh, been a lot of Albions on my channel recently, and there's going to be a few more following this. And this is not to say that my channel is only going to fun uh, feature high-end swords. I really do enjoy reviewing much lower cost swords and mid-range swords as well. It just so happened that at this time of the year with SoCal Sword Fight just happening and me proxy buying a few swords and then sword friend Brian who sent this sword to me also had sent me two swords to review. So there was a set of series of events that ended up making for a series of videos that are focused on higher end swords. It's not going to be that way all the time. It's just for the next, honestly, few months, I am going to be reviewing swords in the thousand dollar price range. If that's not what you're interested in, perfectly fine and perfectly understandable. That is what I focus my collection on, but I also do like to review lower cost swords and you will see those in the future on this channel. So with that out of the way, let's talk about this specific sword. This is the Albion Baron. It sells new for $1,248 from Albion. And if you order from them, the wait time is over two years at this point. This is, as I mentioned before, not my sword. It was sent to me by my friend Brian, who also sent me the Bayou for, uh, that I reviewed two weeks ago. So thank you, Brian, for allowing me to review this sword. Now, it's important to say this is a used sword. There are scuffs on it. There's scratches. It's been sharpened, I believe, with a Ken Onion work sharp. So there's a bit more pronounced of a secondary bevel than you would normally see. You know, that kind of thing. There's also a tiny bit of damage to one facet of the pommel. None of this is what you would have got directly from Albion. Lastly, this is not the original grip wrap from Albion. This was sent by Brian to Matthew Cross to do a rewrap and dye it this color. And that, I believe, for this length of a grip would cost $150 from Matthew. So I am in the unique position of having two of the same model sword in my possession at this time. This is the one I am reviewing that is owned by Brian. This Baron I picked up at SoCal Sword Fight for sword friend Dan, and he's letting me hold on to it for a little bit longer than needed so that I could do uh, somewhat of a comparison of the two swords, since it is not often that you get to see two of the exact same model Albion next to each other. Now what's kind of especially interesting here is that the grip colors are very, very similar. This is on Dan's, this is the light campaign brown of Albion. And on this one was the, is the rewrap by Matthew Cross with kind of a light tan. I'm not sure exactly what color it is, but they're pretty similar, just that the one direct from Albion has a bit more modeling to it. Now, these two swords, feel very, very similar, which makes sense. They are the same model, and Alpian is typically quite good at staying within spec, although there are differences. There's, uh, the main difference is that Brian's weighs about four ounces less than Dan's. This weighs three pounds, 15 ounces, three pounds, a little over 11 ounces. And from what I can tell, that's due to two things. I'm going to put down one of them for a moment so I can kind of show you better what I mean. So here on Dan's, the thickness right at the fuller ending is a little bit thicker than on Brian's. It stays a little bit thicker and it still gets down to about the same thickness out near the tip, but it's a little bit thicker right in here. And that's making a considerable difference from what I can tell. It affects the percussion node by about half an inch, if I remember right. And that's really 
The only big difference I can feel between these two swords, let me pick up Brian's. So this does feel a little bit lighter. And the other reason I think it is a, a little bit lighter is that this has been resharpened. And I believe it was done on a Ken, a Ken Onion Worksharp. So it has a secondary bevel and it has had material removed from that sharpening. I don't think it's that much from sharpening, but it is there. And that combined with the fact that this does get a little bit thinner right around the end of the fuller, a little bit quicker than the one from SoCal Sword Fight, I think that's the primary cause of the weight difference. And here we have a comparison of the measurements I took of both swords. I will have my normal graphic up with the measurements of Brian's sword in the normal point, but I thought this would be a really cool comparison. And you can see the slight difference in thickness that I referred to. Now they do feel remarkably similar, which does make sense. They're very similar. It's just that this one weighs a few ounces less. However, that does translate to this sword feeling a little bit livelier, a little bit less uh, authoritative. There's a little bit less weight out here than there is on the one from SoCal Sword Fight. And personally, I like the way this one handles a little bit more. And one other thing I want to point out on th this one from SoCal Sword Fight is that the edge is not polished quite as well as I would like to see. It looks to me like it's a lower grit than the rest of the sword. And I would like to see the edge just polished up a little bit, a little bit more time put on it to make it a more refined edge. Taking a look at the hilt, let's start with the pommel. This is a wheel pommel or disc pommel uh, that would be classified as an oak shot type J, which is a rounded shape, although this definitely has a bit of a squished nature to it, more of an oval than a circle, and with a boss that comes rising out of it. Now this has, like pretty much all Albion pommels, has more dimension to it than at first glance. If you just look at it like that, it's like, okay, looks pretty normal. When you look at it like this, you can see that this center uh, section has geometry to it. It's a little bit thicker here and tapers out towards the peen block there. And then, of course, there's these crosses that are, I don't think they're etched. I think they're cut out of the uh, center boss there. They look really nice and give it that extra crusade style, that, that style that is very typical of medieval swords. And overall, the finish on here is quite good. It's a little bit better than I normally see on Albion wheel pommels. There's definitely grind line visibles. There's definitely grind lines visible but not as many as I oftentimes see on their Albion's uh, wheel pommels. So that's a nice touch. The corners here are all chamfered very well. There's not much room for hot spots here. Now wheel pommels are very easy to get uh, aggravate the palm if you're not using them properly. But with the correct technique, the idea, I believe, is for your pinky to rest against the boss there and to help stabilize the blade and help with edge alignment. And when you do that properly, the wheel pommel is not really getting cut into the hand at all. Unfortunately for me personally, I'm not particularly good at that yet. So there was a little bit of discomfort, but that's my fault in poor technique as I understand it. If we look at the peen block, it's on here very nicely. The peen is visible, but not very much. It's smoothed over very well, very cleanly done. Just a, overall a very nice looking peen block and peen. The cross guard on here is a type 2 and it is octagonal in cross section out towards the quillins. Right here in the center it's more, uh, rec not, not quite a rectangle, but it's more quadrilateral and then it transitions into octagonal, which means there's a lot of dimension and geometry to the cross guard. It also has a little bit of a taper in here and then flares out just a little bit towards the quillins. And overall, it's a really beautiful example of this style of cross guard. And just like the pommel, all the corners are chamfered very well. There's no issue with the cross guard biting into the hand at all. 
You could theoretically wrap a finger around the guard and finger the blade, but it's quite thin here, would not be comfortable at all. Now, the gap where the sword meets the cross guard is very well done, as is typical of Albion. The It's there, it's not fit to the fuller, so theoretically it could be better, but frankly this is already better than the vast majority of makers, and it looks very well done, very well fitted. The grip core is wood, and that's from Albion, but the leather wrap and cord texture and risers are all done by Matthew Cross. Now, it's a pretty simple grip design. Matthew just replicated Albion's design here with a riser up near the pommel and one near the cross guard. And it's, like I said, pretty simple. There's not even a riser in the middle, which you oftentimes see. The entire shape of the grip is very well done. It's uh, oval, uh, elliptical, so it's wider than it is thick. And there's just a lot of dimension to it, tapering down to almost circular right here at the pommel. The leather wrap here is outstanding. I've said this in my previous review of the Albion Bayou that Matthew also rewrapped. I can't really tell the difference between this wrap and one of Albion's. Matthew does an outstanding job on his leather work. And while the color, I really like the color. I personally don't like this color for this sword. Something about the Baron, to me, wants a darker color. But that's just personal aesthetics. So I'm going to copy Matthew Jensen's test of how good the grip is for maintaining edge alignment and a secure grip on it. What he describes it as is white knuckling the grip and trying to tw twist the sword in that grip. It shouldn't be able to be twisted. So yeah, I'm white knuckling now. I'm grabbing it as hard as I can and I'm trying and I can't twist it in my hand. So this grip is very well designed. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So this blade is big and it is powerful. It starts wide, it has profile taper, but it is a hefty blade. Now I'm not really gonna talk about the finish much on here other than to say it is pretty typical from Albion if you look past the scratches and signs of sharpening and all that. You know, I think there's also some Ren Wax on here. So the sword is, as a 12A, it is pretty much exemplifies what I think of as a 12A with a broad blade, like I said, a good amount of profile taper, but not a crazy amount, and a flat lenticular cross section. You can also see a flat, very flat hexagonal cross section, although that is much rarer in the reproduction market. With this wide of a blade and out here a very flat and thin blade, this is very much a cut focused sword with enough of a acute enough of a point to still be able to thrust into softer targets and maybe slightly harder targets. However, a 12A is definitely more of a cut focused sword than a thrust focused. It can thrust, but that's definitely not its primary purpose. If we look at the fuller here, they are very well crafted, very evenly ground, and as the, the blade is getting thinner out this way, the fuller is getting shallower and shallower until they kind of blend together into that lenticular cross section. Looking at both, where it terminates on both sides, it's really hard to say exactly if they terminate in the same spot because like I said, it's a very gradual transition. But from what I can tell, it is pretty much at the same spot. There might be a very slight amount of a wobble on one out towards the end of the termination, but barely there. And looking at the surfaces of the blade, I don't really see any rippling at all. The tip here is very evenly formed, although the extra sharpening has is very noticeable up here, which is to be expected. The geometry here makes extra sharpening a little tough there. The very, very tip, the point, is rounded over a little bit, which is very um, typical for this type of sword. And overall, I, I, I've kind of said this before in this review, this sword is just very much 
exactly what I expect out of a 12A. Very iconic, very much what I would th describe as a great sword of war. I'm going to test the edges on the sword on some paper. Now this is not the stock edge from Albion, it has been resharpened. So this is a, more about providing context of how sharp the sword is for the footage, the cutting footage you're going to see shortly. All right, so it failed to start the cut out here and then it was able to bite in more around here. It, it really did start the cut a little bit out there, but it is it is struggling to bite into the paper just a little bit. Let's try inserting it. And there, once, once the cut is started, it's a pretty smooth cut, but it is tearing a little bit. All right, the other edge. So again, it failed to... To bite in up here and then started the cut up here or back here. Okay, so it did bite in a little bit up here and then it started tearing back here. This does seem to be a little bit of an inconsistent sharpening. Yeah, so if you saw there, it was kind of slicing through a little bit and then stuttering a little. So a little inconsistent of a sharpening job on this. So cutting with this sword was the story of two experiences. The first time I went to cut with it was on tatami and I failed. Frankly, I just had a miserable time with this sword and it was my fault. There's two things wrong here. First, my staking of the tatami mat was not good and it was not, it, it did not stay on the stand well. Secondly, my technique with the sword was off. Now keep in mind, I am still very early in my experience with knowing how to cut with this type of sword and I was really struggling to accelerate the tip and get this the speed up there so that the sword will cut properly. I did get one cut all the way through, but even that wasn't that good of a cut. But I don't blame this sword. I blame my technique here. My technique was off on pretty much every cut. My hands were leading the cut rather than the sword leading the cut. And that meant my tip speed was not up there and I was not properly cutting with the sword. So. That was the first time I cut with the sword. The second time I took it out to the backyard to do water bottles, my typical target. And this time, while I was still not great with my technique, it was much improved. I was doing much better job of accelerating the tip. I was really focusing on and putting extra effort into getting the tip moving quickly. And it lightsabered through most of the targets. In fact, this was, as far as I can remember, this is the only cutting session I've had in recent memory where I did not fail a single cut. You know, when I do these videos, I don't show every single cut I do. I go for the ones that look good, that show what the sword's capable of, sometimes what mistakes I made, things like that. Well, I didn't, I, I didn't get super clean cuts every time, but I never once failed to cut through a bottle. I never sent a bottle flying. And I got some very clean, very good cuts with the proper technique. And this isn't even fully proper technique. This is just improved technique. With it, good enough technique, this sword is cuts like a dream. All right, let's talk about how this beast of a sword handles. Now this one, as I mentioned earlier, is a little lighter weight than the normal Albion Baron. This is around three pounds 11, three pounds 12 ounces, and the Baron spec is more three pounds 15 ounces. So somewhere between three to four ounces lighter than spec. And this is still a beefy, powerful sword. You know, as a 12A, they're, they're sometimes kind of referred to as great swords of war. And I believe that's a historical term also. And the Baron feels like it deserves that uh, designation. This is a big, 
powerful, beefy sword that is still very well balanced. You know, it is balanced only around, looks to me like that's around four inches from the cross guard, but it has just got a lot of weight on it overall throughout the entire blade. It's got a big beefy pommel, a wide blade with a decent amount of profile taper, and it gets pretty thin out here, but just overall a beefy blade. Now, Albion's website says that you can use this one-handed, and maybe some people could. For me, I would not feel comfortable. I think every time I swung, my wrist would end up breaking and I'd get that ulnar deviation that is so bad for your wrists. So for me, this is a full-on two-handed sword. Maybe other people can do it one-handed, just not me. Now, despite all that weight, this is not an unwieldy sword. It is balanced well. It has a lot of authority in the cut, but the tip is not noticeably heavy. It's the whole sword is feels big and heavy and authoritative. There is a lot of weight in the hilt. You can feel it when you pick it up. It's like there's weight back here, which makes the tip feel there. I can definitely feel the weight out here, but it's not tip heavy. It doesn't feel like it's going to drag me out of position when I'm cutting with it. It feels like it wants to cut but it doesn't feel like it's going to, like I said, drag me out of position. But what that weight does do, at least for me personally, is it makes this sword relatively difficult to accelerate particularly well. If I go into a stance, hopefully you can see this, and just try to accelerate it with my fingers, definitely can. And I get some sword wind there, but it is, difficult. I have to put extra effort into it. I have to really think about it and consciously make an effort to really try to accelerate the tip and get it out there. When that I'm able to do that, this sword handles incredibly well. When I don't, it doesn't feel particularly good. So good technique certainly plays a part in how this sword handles and feels. But even with good technique, this is not a quick sword. This is a powerful sword. It is a hell of a single cu cutter, but I don't think it would be a particularly good cutter if, like if you were thinking about competition cutting and trying to do like a unterhau followed by an, a middle how like a double cut. This is not a fast sword. Maybe some people can get it to do that. I certainly, I've never been done a double cut before, but I don't think I would ever want really want to try with this sword, at least not anytime soon. It doesn't, particularly move quickly enough that I would want to do that for me personally. And to expand on this just a little bit, here is Philip Martin doing some cutting with an Albion Baron. Obviously Philip is a master at this, but you can see that it does move just a little bit slower than swords he normally cuts with. Now for a comparison to the Baron, I have here a Kingston Arms 13A, it could also be a 13C. I would have to look into it a little bit closer as to which uh, classification would fit it better. Now these are notably different swords. The Baron is considerably longer, has a lot more profile taper, but they are all, both, would both, I would think, be considered great swords of war. And this sword is definitely hefty enough to feel, to be called that. Now what's interesting about this Kingston Arms sword is it is lighter than the Baron by quite a bit. It's around three pounds, four ounces, but it has a ton more weight out here, it, at least more feel out here. The, the feel of the blade is very much tip focused to a strong degree. This is not a sword that feels all that nimble to me personally. It's balanced a ways out from the guard. That looks like that's about five to six inches around there. And with a small uh, pommel, not a particularly huge uh, hilt, that explains why there's so much uh, of the balance is out towards the tip. That's going to make for a very powerful cutter. But it also, while it's, I don't find it particularly hard to accelerate the tip 
I find it actually a little bit easier to accelerate the tip than the bearing. Part of that is this pommel. I can rest against it a little bit easier than the I can on the bearing. But I find that tip weight means it's harder to stop the cut. And I find that my hands are actually dragging down a little bit further than I like than, than I like them to do. But that doesn't mean this is not that tip weight does not mean this is balanced poorly. It just means it's got a ton of authority in the cut. What I said about the Baron not being a quick sword and not being the sword I would really want to do double cuts with or anything like that, take that even more so with this sword. This sword really does not feel like a sword I'm going to want to do more than, you know, maybe continue the motion more. I can't do that really very well in, indoors without fear of hitting something. I don't feel like it, this is a cut and stop sword. This is more of a cut and continue the motion so you, you're not wasting energy trying to stop the cut. You're allowing the, the sword cut to flow through to the next cut. And one other thing I want to point out on the Baron here is that it has a decent amount of flex. Not a crazy amount. It's not super flexible. But it definitely has some flex out here towards the tip. And what I notice, if I just hold it out here, try to stabilize me. So I think you can probably see the tip kind of vibrates a little bit just because there's a lot of weight back here, not a lot of weight up here. So the little movements back here tend to make the sword vibrate a little bit. And I also find that if I'm when I'm cutting, this is true of pretty much all earlier medieval swords that I've handled. When your edge alignment is off a little bit, these swords do not forgive you for that. If you don't have the proper technique, these swords do not deliver good cuts. And whereas later medieval swords that are typically more rigid, they tend to be able to power through the cut even with if with less technique and less tip speed and less edge alignment because of that rigidity. They kind of push through the target and still deliver a cut, usually not a very clean one if your technique is off. Not the case with the Baron or earlier medieval swords in my hands. So let's talk bottom line. This sword costs you $1,248 if you buy it new directly from Albion. With, if you buy it directly from them, around a two year wait time. I think it's actually beyond two years at this point. What do you get for that price and that weight? You get a great sword of war. I don't think there is a better mass produced example of a great sword of war than the Albion Baron. And I'm using mass produced pretty loosely there. Albion makes, produces a good number of swords. I don't know that mass produced is a, the, the right term for them. But in terms of a model that there are multiple examples of, this is a great sword of war and it is just really exemplifies it. Everything about it to me says great sword of war. And you get a sword that I think is absolutely stunning. The craftsmanship as always with Albion is outstanding. The attention to history and attention to detail, outstanding. And you get a sword that with the correct technique is a hell of a cutter. But at the same time, if your technique is off, it does not like to cut at all. It demands good technique. And if you are not up to the challenge of using the sword properly, you're not going to enjoy using this as a backyard cutter. And when I say you, I'm really talking about me here. You know, I when I had poor technique, this sword was not fun to cut with at all. When my technique was better, ooh, man, did this sword cut amazingly well, very cleanly. So it's actually, in some ways, a good training tool in that regard, in that it's going to give me good feedback when I cut well, and feedback that I did not do my technique right when I didn't do it. It's going to give me that useful feedback. But at the same time, with this being three pounds, 12 ounces, up to three pounds, 15, depending on which one you get. Like I said, this one's a little bit lighter than Albion's normal specs. With it being that heavy, it's not, for me, a particularly great training tool because it is tiring. 
it does wear me out faster than pretty much any other sword I've used. So while that can be good for building stamina and uh, being able to swing for longer and more, when I'm trying to perfect my technique, and not even perfect the technique, just really build the muscle memory of what technique I'm trying to do, this, I, I want repetitions. I want a lot of repetitions. I want to do a lot of cutting. And a heavier, more powerful sword, while it gives me the good feedback, it's not giving me those repetitions. But is it worth the price? Yes, absolutely. Again, absolutely iconic medieval uh, great sword of war. A heck of a fun backyard cutter when you're using it properly. Just gorgeous. I think this sword is one of Albion's most attractive ones, especially if when you go to their website, look at the pictures for the Albion. I'll put it up on screen. They have one with, I believe it's a black grip and an antique tilt. Oh, it looks so good. It's like the perfect barren to me. And that might be why I think it, uh, it looks better with the darker hilt as opposed to this brighter hilt. Probably more just because that specific one just speaks to me so much. But yes, the sword is absolutely worth the price, especially if this is the type of sword you like. You are not going to find a better one for the same price and it, from what I have seen. And that's going to wrap up this review. I want to give a huge thank you to my friend Brian for allowing me to review this Baron and the Bayou I reviewed two weeks ago. This is now, I believe, the fourth sword of Brian's that I've reviewed and the fifth that he has at least owned in the past. So a huge thank you to Brian's generosity. For everybody else, make sure you leave a comment, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't, do all those things that YouTube wants you to do. Until next time, Alien Toot out.